Nigeria's Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, has this week been raising the alarm on increasing institutional challenges affecting the process of selecting judges in Nigeria. Speaking at a virtual conference last weekend, Professor Oshimbajo claimed that that process is continually being subjected to undue pressure by desperate politicians, owners of big business, and a litany of other vested interests. What then could be the short, medium, and long-term impact of this situation on the dispensation of justice in Nigeria? Most people will readily point to the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. But how functional has this widely acclaimed piece of legislation been? For a more comprehensive analysis, we are now being joined by Abdul Jalili Owonikoko, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and Managing Partner, mm -hmm. Sinegi Atom. <laughs> Onikoko SAN, good morning, and thank you for joining us again this uh, morning on the uh, morning show. Well, you must have listened to my introduction. What exactly is the problem with the appointment of judges, and what will you recommend? Um, a reform of the National Judicial Council, or also of the uh, Federal Judicial Service uh, Commission? And is it true, as alleged by the Vice President, uh, that uh, external interests, politicians, businessmen, influence the appointment of judges? Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Good morning, my Thank sisters. Um, I think the debate about the state of our judicial system is an ongoing one, and it's work in progress. The truth of the matter is that anywhere in the world, governance system where you have repression of powers, does not imply what a tight lack of interconnection between the three arms of government. Even in the US, appointment process in the US to the bench at the federal level is purely political. And that's why you see an entire presidential election may turn on the impact that the incoming president may have on the justice system. If you recall during the last election in in the U.S., one of the touchstone of uh, President Trump's campaign was the opportunity he was going to have to make certain critical appointments to the uh, appellate bench, actually the Supreme Court of the U.S. And an appointee of President Obama was kept uh, untouched by the Senate until he left office to create room for the new incoming, the president that was coming to appoint his own preferred candidate. And so in Nigeria, the Constitution has given a role for the political heads of government in appointment of judges in our Superior Court of Records. The point is that is there an elite discipline to determine a common goal that we want to use our judiciary to achieve under Section 36, which is to ensure that there is a fair, independent, and credible this resolution institution in the country that can attract confidence, both of the citizens and even the foreigners that want to come and live within your environment. I think that lack of consensus of the elite to have an untrammeled and credible justice system accounts for the problem we are facing. So a time will not come where just a group of people in the judiciary will be given absolute power to, to choose whoever they want as judges. There will always be an, a role for the executive and the legislature in terms of screening some of the head of court and in terms of the council itself. Now, what I see here from the vice president's uh, observations at the webinar this weekend is an admission that we have been for too long uh, undermining some of the props and controls and defenses against abuse of the appointment process. Let me explain what I mean by this. There is a robust and very, very uh, uh, well put together rules of procedure for appointment of judges by the NJC. I took time to look at them this morning again after I was invited, and I was surprised to see that even under Rule 4, Sub 4 of the Rules of Appointment, Every single item of abuse that Mr. Vice President identified 
constitute grounds of disqualification for appointment as a judge. Um, it's a ground for disqualification that you canvass or lobby either a political authority, a traditional institution, or vested interest to facilitate your appointment. Now, if Mr. Pre Vice President identifies these as some of the bane for why we don't have uh, a credible judicial uh, justice system, then it is not that the rules are not there to actually checkmate these anomalies. It is that as a group, as a society, we don't have the discipline to stick to the basic rules that allow for proper functioning of our institutions. In the UK, for instance, as used to be in Nigeria, the greatest asset that the United States, United Kingdom has in terms of world attraction to their economy is the trust in their justice system. Everybody, when you have a choice of a forum for this resolution, you always consider London as a seat, if you are talking of arbitration, than any other country. Then their common law system dominates the way the entire world works. If you go back to how Singapore managed to get out of the bind of underdevelopment, one of the key things they did was to address the integrity of their justice system. That today, Singapore ranks probably with number one or two in terms of trust of their legal system. And what do they do? They go for the merit and merit only. In Nigeria today, I'm afraid to say, even in Lagos, there is a movement, for instance, by Lagos indigenous to ensure that only Lagosians are appointed to the Lagos, to the judicial bench in Lagos. Because over time, they felt that they were being marginalized, that non-Lagosians kept on getting appointed to the Lagos bench, to the point where majority of appointees on the, of the judiciary in Lagos were non-Lagosians, and they felt choked, and they had to form a group of people to converse for and uh, push for appointment of Lagos indigenous onto the bench. Now, how does that feel make a non-Lagosian feel when he's appearing before a Lagos High Court judge? If you see this kind of campaign that is being forcefully pro promoted, how does that give you confidence? And that actually is a breach of the rules for appointment of judges. I'm not saying that they were wrong not to defend their own interests, but it tells you, for instance, part of the lack of trust in the system. Meanwhile, the rules for appointment totally will have rendered any person promoted by such a group unqualified for appointment. Now, it's not only Lagos. I'm sure the same thing happens in other, other parts of the country. Look at states where a person rises to the, point, to the point of automatically becoming acting CJ of a state because it's either only maritally related to the state, the parliament that should eventually screen him and the governor that should appoint will refuse to do that. I was uh, totally... Uh, bewildered about the fate of the last CJ, of uh, the last acting CJ of uh, Kebi. How even on the day of our, our last sitting, she was not allowed to sit to even the Vajimi as an act, so that she does not become, after being recognized by NJC, a CJ and retire. The same thing in Cross River. We had the same thing in Rivers. So what I have seen here is that we must define what is our vision for our justice system. Is it just to have it as one of the required institutions, or we want to use it as a vehicle, an instrument for developing trust in our system and creating an environment where people believe that rule of law is colorblind, rule of law is influence blind. If you recall the case of Bajovic in, uh, I think, in Chicago, his mere suggestion that he could influence somebody's appointment to federal cabinet of President Obama, he was a mayor, I think later a governor, led him to be tried for influence peddling in appointment. And he was in prison for all through the period of Obama's appointment until now that President Trump gave him a reprieve. He was sentenced, he was tried and sentenced. Married to one of the richest families in Chicago, even though he was not originally from that place. But things we just do in Nigeria, we take for granted that system will not collapse no matter how much we test it. I think it's a clarion call for all of us to know that it's not just the judges alone. The community, the values we share, all go to determine how reliable, credible our justice system is. Well, could you also comment on the second leg of the question about reform of the NJC and uh, the FJSC, uh, particularly as state governors are also saying that, look, uh, they want to be uh, the ones to appoint 
uh, high court judges in their states. And, you know, some lawyers also say that uh, the uh, CJN, the Chief Justice of Nigeria, has overbearing powers over the appointment of uh, uh, judges and that the NJC is in need of reform, the FJSC is also in need of reform. Well, uh, thanks. Let's not forget that we used to have a system where each region had absolute control on appointment of their judges, and they even had prerogative of creating their own court of appeal. Lagos, the uh, Western region had its own court of appeal, which is peopled by appointees of the state. But when we move further to the right of federalism, I mean, sorry, to the left of federalism, by creating unitary structures in our constitutional arrangement, it became impossible, especially when you recall the era when military governors were even appointed by federal head of state. The structure of the constitution now does not allow for what is being clamored. But I can assure you, from my reading of the very rigorous procedure put in place by the NJC for appointment of judges, if everybody plays his role, the CJN cannot have overriding powers, number one. Number two, there is the financing aspect of this justice system at the state level. Why do you want to have as many judges in, say, a state like uh, Kebi as you have in Lagos? Just because the fund for the infrastructure and everything comes from the National Share Council. That's why there is a provision for need that will be justified. And funding, whenever you want to increase the number of your appointees as judges, there must be part of the memo that will go to NJC by the state uh, Judicial Service Commission, provisions for the number of additional judges you are looking for, the need for them, the workload of judges that are already sitting, the infrastructure required to ensure that when these judges are appointed, they are not appointed without facilities to ensure that they deliver credibly and diligently on their work. If you leave these to states, what we're going to have is that every member house of assembly will want to have a high court in his local government where they cannot have more than 10 cases in a year so that they can have a judge. And then from there, we say, there must be a judge appointed who is an indigent of your local government. I don't believe that is where the problem is. I believe the problem <clears throat> is better solved by addressing the fundamental inadequacies in our justice system, part of which is being addressed by some of these addition of justice legislation that are being made, both by the federal and state level, to fast track hearing, make the court more accessible, make the job of the judges comfortable, and then restore the prestige of the court personnel. I was really devastated during the last exercise where judges' apartment houses were being raided at the middle of the night. Some majority of them turned out to be innocent people. And these are people that are not allowed by the ethics of their calling to be heard in the public about their inner concerns. The NBA had to come out to, I mean, stand in for them to ensure that some form of dignity is restored. How many successful practicing lawyers today Seeing what is going on in our court, would, unless under serious comp compulsion and pressure, opt to go to the bench. And one of the requirements for appointing to the bench is that you must demonstrate that you are not financially impecunious. So when people who are not successful in practice but have access to political influence peddler go to the bench, what do you expect? They get to the bench, they are in need, they are under pressure to meet basic needs. They, did not, they don't have reserve to call on other than to seek assistance of friends, relations, or other kinds of uh, influence peddlers. From that moment, you start compromising the dependence of the judges. A judge today is celebrated because a governor has made available a brand new Pajero SUV. Meanwhile, these are common conveniences that politicians enjoy. We have the financial autonomy amendment to the Constitution. We should have, as of today, made it unnecessary for a, a, a governor to be demonstrating fleet of cars that he's buying for courts, because all of that are supposed to enter the budget of the head of court. The court system, the civil work infrastructure are supposed to be all being funded now straight by the head of the courts. But that is not what is happening. 
So I would uh, rather say that all of us must introspect both the judicial officers and the judicial service consumers, the ordinary Nigerians, whether they are politicians, businessmen, we must all agree that we must first make this system to work. Let Nigeria be a, a, a magnet of this resolution for Africa under, for instance, the after, so that people will choose us as the best destination to come and have their resolutions res resolved. You see people fly in to come and handle their cases. Within two, three days, the cases come they go back. From all over Africa, there will be international traffic, there will be financial inflow, there will be all sorts of advantages that you can get from having a functioning and trusted judicial system. Beyond just the issue of simple expectation of ah, things are not going well, we must all use our judiciary as an engine of economic attraction, attraction of economic development and also for building of trust. I will give you a very worrisome example, and I'll conclude my contribution by saying what I think is missing. Mm -hmm. I was involved in a matter in 2007 in which somebody was accused of having given false information to the police about a, a priest, a, a religious priest, who was alleged to be abhorring uh, young girls and whatever. This gentleman competition to the IG that it was, that was a false information money was stolen. He was charged to court. The client was charged with handling the case pro bono. We made a no case about the conclusion of trial. Then the magistrate was to be transferred. We thought that would mean starting all over again. We decided to write for a fear to the CJ to allow the magistrate to conclude the case. After the magistrate was transferred, the person who complained eventually was found to have committed murder, killing some of the people we are, that were led to be harbored in his house. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. From court of appeal, high court to court of appeal, up to Supreme Court, is having hanging on his neck a death sentence. Can you believe that since 2070 today, that case that we transferred to have concluded on, on a basis of no case submission was never concluded. Even the no case submission ruling that was awaited, that's 13 years ago, has not been delivered. But the person who complained has been found guilty of murder, is being tried at all the trial, mm. all the levels of government. And now, just recently, that magistrate is now a high court judge. We okay. had a, mo a ruling on no case for 13 years. We even had to go to high court Mr. to compel the matter to be there. At a point in the course of trial, these other complainants even asked, after he had been con 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 uh, condemned to death, that he needed to come and testify in the case. Mr. Onikoko, if you can hear me. From somewhere in the north, where he was. Mm. Right, right, Mr. Mr. Onikoko. Mr. Hello, if sir. Can, if you can hear if you can me. Hear, yeah. Okay, so um, some people will say these challenges are not new and, and no, they are not unknown. Um, but let's talk a bit more about financial autonomy, which you talked about. If Mr. Onikoko can hear me. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure Mr. Onikoko can hear us. So we'll try to fix that. That issue would not have been targeted in the course of appointing that judicial officer to the higher bench. How do you convince that gentleman who had been standing there for 13 years for an offense that will have had only one year imprisonment and he has made a no case submission, convincing that our system works? If the person who complained against him has had to eventually to be tried for murder, found guilty, up to the highest level, and he is still going to court every day for 13 years, simply to wait for a ruling on whether a no case submission on the complaint against him will be heard or not. So I think the missing point here is that in appointment, as the, one of the interrogators at the webinar said, the appointment should not be a matter just for lawyers alone, because this is a service that is meant for the entire society. The public must be able to at least make their own impute into appointment. It does not mean that the appointing process is subject to whatever their opinion is. But at least it will give them a chance to see that they have some form of involvement in the process of appointing judges so that the confidence we expect the public to have in them will be further enhanced. So that's the practical demonstration of what we are going through now. So there should be a more robust opportunity for the public to comment and give their own view about potential appointees to the bench. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can hear me now, Mr. Wonikoko. I've been trying to get your attention. 
But let's talk a bit more about the financial autonomy, which you talked about. Uh, are you saying that, you know, the lifeline given by President Muhammadu Buhari when he signed the Executive Order 10 uh, to give financial autonomy, autonomy to state legislatures and judiciary is not enough? And like I was saying, many of these challenges are not unknown and they're not new. But the solutions are practicable. I'm talking about the input of the public. Uh, let me ask you about jury trials. We do not have that in Nigeria. Uh, do you think that we have too much powers vested in the judges and justices? OK. Uh, for jury trials, for jury trials, there used to be a time in Lagos where we had something akin to that. But you have to consider the environment in which we live. Our justice system is alien and foreign. Some of the values and requirements for conduct of jurors are not indigenous to our lifestyle. For instance, if you have a jury trial, it's more expensive, yeah. number one. Number two, people who are not even trained in determining disputes, when you sit them down to conduct jury trial, and the, given the level of our illiteracy and uh, also poverty, as well as kinship and clannishness, it is very unlikely that that may assist. And it's very expensive. That's why it's better for us to make our judicial officers' appointment transparent, credible enough for people to have trust in them. Because if you are talking of jury trial, it also has zone drawbacks. It has zone drawbacks because at the end of the day, they preempt the final judgment. If they form an opinion and just one of them disagrees, you have a hung jury. The case has to start all over. So in jury trial, you tend to have more and more of cases being sent back for a trial and you go through the same process over and over. I don't think Nigeria can afford the luxury, and I cannot even also see that it has any beneficial interest, except, for instance, for cases that have some political. I wouldn't mind, for instance, election petition being subject to some form of jury trial. Because mm. in that case, by the time you are going to have a jury trial in election petition, the various shade of you know, who pass the election will form part of those that constitute the jury, panel of uh, jurors, and they will reflect better on the real outcome of the election, that when a judge is posted from Lagos to go and sit on a tribunal in Uyo, and then is bombarded with volumes and volumes of election materials, and hundreds of lying witnesses who are used to that kind of political you know, uh, test testimonies. That may be one of those, there may be instances where jury trial may be useful, but I don't think on the whole it is uh, recommended. What I think, uh, experience has shown to work is judges to be a bit more specialized in terms of cases they handle. A clear precedent we have that shows its work is the National Industrial Court. I have observed that that court, because it's a specialized court, they are familiar with the cases, they are familiar with the issues, they are on top of the trial, and the trials don't last for more than one year or two. I've had cases that were pending in the high court for like 10 years involving employer and employee. And when the NIC was uh, elevated to a, a superior court of record and the case was transferred there, we finished most of them under one year or two because the judges are trained specifically and are experts in labor matters. The same reason why if you go to court of appeal in say some Sharia matters, Sharia matters I don't know, they don't last for too long, but the judges are specially trained in Sharia issues, Islamic law, and when you get to court of appeal too, a member of the panel that will hear the matter must be somebody that is learning Islamic law, so he can assist his brother judges in coming to a decision. Okay. The other point that uh, worries me is that we don't seem to be allowing the, to expand the pool of talents that can come to the bench. There is too much of careerism in appointment now. Uh, people think that getting to the bench means automatic rise from high court to Supreme Court. But we have high court judges who never went to the court of appeal, even in Nigeria. But their reputation till today has remained indelible. Justice J.I.C. Taylor was, at the time, in Supreme Court. He came back to come see of Lagos. He was one of the best judges we have ever produced in Nigeria. He retired as judge of, chief judge of uh, Lagos High Court. So if you need to uh, introduce, inject people with broader perspectives, 
into the bench. You don't have to limit them to serving judges if you are going to consider a court of appeal. And okay. this initiative was even himself championed by the vice president sometime okay. ago okay. when they came into power to allow okay. practitioners from outside the bench to come. Uh, to sir, the sir if you can hear me, I just have a quick they question don't for have you. To preponderate, but can you hear me, sir? At least giving the other side of view on can how. Can you hear me, sir? That's why we have today too much of technicalities in our justice system. Can, can you, you hear me, sir? Seventy percent uh, of them are decided, they're decided on technicalities. And okay. They very suffer. So okay. If you can hear me, let me come in here quickly, sir. If, if you can hear me, if, if you can hear me, sir, let me come in here quickly. You cited the case of Rod Blagojevich, you know, the former governor of Chicago, as regards influence peddling the other time. You talked about the fact that he's been released now. He's been released now because of political mind, because Trump has an attorney called William Barr that can, you know, do things for him as regards that. In, in 30 seconds, how would you, you know, what would you say about political influence and how we can remove it permanently from judiciary? Thank you very much. Uh, I was asking you how do we remove uh, political influence, but I guess you addressed that, that, uh, you know, basically everyone is interested in the appointment of judges and the legislature and the executive, everybody uh, would uh, naturally show interest. Thank you very much.